Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the people that actually did the work. <laughs> it's uh, Tyler uh, Myler. Tyler um, just graduated with his master's degree from my lab and actually just arrived in China uh, to work with the second um, of my cohorts, I'm sorry, second of my cohorts, which is Yo Jing. Uh, Yo Jing was a, a postdoc in my lab when she uh, this work was done. She's now at the um, Wenzhou uh, Institute of Geochemistry at Ch uh, Chinese Academy of Science in uh, Wenzhou, China. What's interesting about this relationship of uh, Tyler being sent to Beijing is that he's starting to um, set up her lab for her. They're going to work together on that. Started putting uh, together uh, the litter systems, and they're going to continue this TIE work in China. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the, in the talk. The other uh, co-investigator, and this was John Wong, a postdoc in my lab at the time, is now a professor at uh, Texas Tech University. It's an interesting project for me because I've, I've not had a chance to work up in this area of the state. Um, I, most of my relatives actually um, were housed up in the Wilmington, Joliet, in, in the southern part of the Chicago area, so it's nice to be able to come back up here. Um, it was a two-year project for us, and it was basically building on some research that was done back in the early 90s by a number of folks, um, um, uh, Alan Burton and uh, Sparks and Ross and others, found that there was some issues associated with the sediment uh, contamination up and down the Illinois River. Um, and they used a TIE approach also, but a, a poor water TIE. We decided to uh, continue this work in the last couple of years, but to use a sediment TIE in this uh, in our uh, experiments. So we'll start with the definition of what TIE is. It's a toxic identification evaluation is to use some type of physical and chemical manipulation of a sample to isolate or change the potency of the different groups of toxicants potentially present in the sample. It's kind of a mouthful. So if you have a sediment that is contaminated with a non polar organic and at a high enough concentration of those contaminants, you expect all your animals to be dead then in theory you should be able to go in and amend sediments for different classes of contaminants and remove that toxicity. So you can amend it with a non polar organic uh, um, amendment of some sort, amend it with a, for ammonia or for metals and remove those toxicants. And in theory, if everything works, here a lot of animals will survive in that amendment, indicating the exact class of compounds that you're interested in. So it's a, a, a biological and a chemical manipulation uh, combined type of technique. Sediments are the um, area of interest, or the, the uh, media of interest for the study. And a sediment is kind of a complex system. You have the sediment grains um, associated with it. Uh, and those are very complex in their own nature. You have all the nooks and crannies and, and all the, the different components of, of a sediment grain. We also have the pore water, the, the water in between the sediment particles. And you can, again, do testing using these TIE approaches using either type of media extracting the pore water out, and the typical means by which to do that is a centrifugation step, or use the whole sediment. And um, we decided to use the whole sediment because we felt there were some issues associated with the pore water approach. And that is the question of bioavailability. Obviously, if you have a, you're extracting this, this water out of the sediment matrix, you're no longer uh, having contact with the sediment particles, and therefore bioavailability could be a, a question. Obviously, you can't ingest the materials, and there's been work by uh, Peter Landrum for years and years and years out of NOAA, and some work that we've done in our lab showing the ingestion of certain uh, non pore organics can be a very important route of uptake uh, in these systems. Uh, water quality parameters can vary quite a bit. In a pore water system, you um, can have elevated pH, uh, elevated hardness, um, in, uh, in the sediment exposures, it will be quite different. And it comes down to a question, is environmentally realistic to use just the pore water phase in a test where you're exposed to an entire sediment? So, if you look at a TIE, it turns a series of steps. The first step is basically site sampling, or selection of sites, and going out and sampling those sites. Then there's a series of screening toxicity tests to figure out which of the sediments are actually toxic. And then you can go in with your phase one characterization where you're going to amend the sediments again for three classes of compounds. You can amend the, the sediment for ammonia by adding a zeolite to, to basically bind to the ammonia. You can add Resintec to uh, chelate to the cationic metals, or you can add the uh, powdered uh, coconut charcoal to knock out the non-polar organics. 
with the same theme that if you add the right amendment, your animals will survive. After you get through step three, you've identified that there's a particular class of compounds you're interested in. You can identify those chemically by going in and running either ammonia propylene ammonia, some type of extraction with an atomic absorption to get the cationic metals, or accelerated solvent extraction with either GC or an HPLC to identify the contaminants of concern. That's a nice series of steps to get you to your end product, which is hopefully identification of the compounds that are causing your toxicity at the site. The other component of this is that you want to be able to normalize for the relative potency of the compounds that you're looking at. And so we use what's called a toxic unit approach or TU approach. You take the concentration of contaminant in that media for water or sediment and divide it by the LC50 for that media. Objectives. Um, we were to go in and identify toxic sites throughout the Illinois River complex and, and um, uh, identify the contaminant classes, either ammonia, metals, or non core organics that attribute to that toxicity. Again, using a whole sediment TIE, which is a little bit different than the poor water TIE approach that had been used back in the early 90s. We wanted to evaluate temporal and spatial trends in the correlation of toxicity at those sites. And then, because those earlier studies were done with, again, with a poor water technique, we wanted to compare and contrast the two TIE methodologies and then go back and compare them to the, the work that was done again by Alan Burke and others back in the early 90s. So we'll start with the site sampling. Um, we chose 24 sites in consultation with uh, John Marlin uh, here at ISTC, and we uh, sampled 2.5 kilograms wet weight of sediment using a uh, Ponar and Ekman uh, graph. Uh, water samples from each site were also retrieved and water quality measurements were taken each site so we could at least emulate the hardness at the site. So the, the, um, the river is basically a very hard water river and so we emulated those same conditions back in the laboratory. We also did uh, total pool water ammonia and we analyzed that at, when we got back to SIUC. Sediments and water samples were processed in my lab. And we took samples in summer of 07, fall of 07, and winter of 07, and spring and summer of 08. Should make note that we also collected, again, water, those water samples with a chemical model, and that was at the sediment water interface. So we had a, a good idea of what the water chemistry looked like at that site. All right, we're down here in Carbondale. Um, we drove all the way up in your St. Louis, and get you oriented here. Our first sampling site was at Moore Toad Head, which is at River Mile 76, and we were sampled all the way up to Halstead Bridge, which is at River Mile 320. Um, John was very interested in checking to see, he was doing a series of pours at the time at uh, Peoria Lake, Sawmill Lake, and Depew Lake, and he gave us some sediments uh, at each of those pours, and at three, six, and nine feet uh, increments. And you can see that data in pours from Peoria, Sawmill Lake, and Depew. Found it very interesting, none of those pores actually were toxic, okay? as we go through this, and I'll show that again in a little bit. So we've selected our sites. We are not going to do our screening toxicity test. The test followed standard EPA protocols with a 10-day bioassay in a flow-through system. We built our flow-through system, uh, as you've shown down here, we have five of these systems now. Again, that's one of the things Tyler's adding to Yuxing's lab in China. Um, did three water changes per day with 100 mils per change. There were 10 high low Azteca, 14 to 21 day old animals, and 300 mils in each of the beakers, and six replicates per site. We had both a control and an amendment site. The control was basically a sediment or soil we use out of Touch of Nature, which is a little bit south of SIU's campus. It's a fairly well characterized soil. Um, we wet it and for it becomes a sediment at that point. And we use that to compare all of our toxicity results. We also choose an amendment reference, which was a lower Peoria Lake. We chose this because we're going to amend some of our sediments with and dilute it with a, a site sediment. And we wanted to have a site sediment that was very similar in, in its characteristics. And I'll show you a little bit that that did not have any toxicity associated with it to make for a good amendment reference. Statistical tests of SAS and NOVA have done as multiple comparisons. So their screening toxicity test, is the sediment toxic or not? So here's the results. This is the 07 results. This is again screening toxicity test. On the y-axis, I have percent survival. On the x-axis, I have increasing river mile from the Dutch of nature, obviously, is our control in Moore's Toadhead to Halstead. 
And note that the star sites are basically indicating where there's significant difference between it and the control in terms of survivorship. And so, as you can tell, the first thing that should jump out at you is there's a trend towards increased toxicity as you go towards Chicago. But it's starting around the Page or the, 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 the Page River, or the Page River site, all the way down to Halstead. The other thing I wanted you to note from the slide is the LPL dredge, which we're again using as our reference, is not toxic. Okay? Now, I'll show you some chemistry from that. It's pretty low level chemist uh, um, contaminant load at that site. And again, none of this, the core sample showed toxicity. The next phase is the actual characterization. We know which sites are toxic due to our screening experiment, so now we characterize. All right? So we can go in and determine the uh, contaminants of concern by amending the sediments with either a zeolite amendment to take out ammonia, and we used an unamended sand to uh, represent uh, any dilution effect that could be occurring in that system. You know, in this test, we ran a 10-day high or a 10 high level per treatment, again, to animals about 10 to 21 days old, with six replicates per treatment. We ran a static test because we're looking at ammonia in the overlying water. So we do not want that to be a concern in terms of a, a flow-through type system. At least we're not simulating that in this type of experiment. The other two amendments, again, are the resin tech. The resin tech takes out metals or binds or chelates metals and the powdered uh, coconut charcoal um, are also added to that sediment. And again, the other minutes, uh, sand was placed in to basically emulate a uh, dilution effect. Those were conducted again with the same number of animals and replicates, but in this case, we're running with the flow through 10 day standard toxicity test as we did in the screening experiments. So we're seeing which compounds will be knocked out with the different chelating type of agents. So, Phase one from the summer of 2007, again, 9% survival on the y-axis. And again, I touched nature in the reference site, and then these are the toxic sites, uh, as shown from the, the initial uh, screening experiments. Note that the addition of zeolite for ammonia and resin tech for the metals did not see any, show any significant differences compared to the unamended sediments. They're not shown on that screen, right? So there's no differences due to those, right? And so now I'm left with the uh, well, first, I should note that there is no difference between the amendment, the PCC amendment for the LPL site and the amendment's treated site. And so the, the amendment itself is not causing an effect in the system. The stars, close stars, or the dark stars, are indicating locations where we saw significant increases or significant uh, differences in toxicity, uh, reduced survivorship in the treatments uh, sites in comparison to control. The blue bars representing the organic uh, amended sites, and note that those are the open stars. And in five, for four out of five uh, cases, you saw an increase in survivorship when you add PCC to the system, strongly suggesting it's a non-polar organic that's causing the effect. Again, especially due to the fact that the zeolite and resin tech did not show any significant uh, changes. So we've characterized that it's, it looks like it's a non-polar organic. Now we go ahead and identify uh, which contaminants or which of the non-polar organics are playing a role. The fairly substantial number of analytes that we look for, there's uh, 21 uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, 42 PCB congeners, 21 organophorine pesticides, um, that one organophosphate, four pyrifos, seven pyrethroid insecticides, which is kind of a pet uh, project for myself because I've been studying pyrethroids in California sediments for a number of years and found them in almost anything, including sewage treatment plant effluent. Um, but uh, I'll talk about those in a little bit. And uh, a series of heavy metals, six heavy metals. And we looked at total ammonia, which is a obviously non-ionized and ionized forms. So a pretty extensive list of, of contaminants. I could just mention, in a standard TIE, you would at this point just look at the non-polar organics. But because the EPA methods have just come out just in the last year to do sediment TIEs, we felt that we want to go ahead and run the entire analyte list to see what's going on at the site. Well, one question you might ask yourself, and I've been asked already from this, this, some of you in this group, is why do you use total ammonia? Well, we use total ammonia for a number of reasons. One, it's commonly formed in standard TIE methods, including the methods the EPA has just for use. It allows comparisons also to Sparks and Ross, Alan Burton's work, and others where they all use total ammonia 
And probably most importantly, it allows for comparisons in poor water situations from site to site where your pH and your temperature are varying quite a bit. Again, we were able to go ahead, measure the hardness of the water at the sediment water interface and emulate that in our study. But to, to take in, to, to uh, re reduce the amount of fluctuations you would see in a site in terms of pH and temperature, which obviously greatly influence the amount of non-ionized ammonia at the site, is very challenging. And so most studies use the total ammonia for that comparison. So some, some uh, chemistry data. Got the metals in micrograms per gram. Again, I'm going to the totals here uh, for gravity purposes in a dry weight basis. Total of poor water ammonia in milligrams of nitrogen per liter. And then pesticides, PCBs, and PAHs in micrograms per gram OC normalized. Note that the reporting limit um, uh, the lower is one microgram per gram, just for the one pesticide. There were uh, other incidents we had detectable concentrations. And nothing really jumps out at you except for this very high concentration of SS315 of a total ammonia, and the PAHs are very, very elevated. And again, throw these concentrations up, they don't mean a whole lot unless I go ahead and normalize for the relative uh, potency of the compounds. And so I put it in that toxic unit approach. Again, it's a concentration in the mediate, the pore water and sediment, divided by the LC50 in that. And again, remember, a low TU represents low toxicity. A high TU is high toxicity. You can see the metals basically fall out as not being um, extremely important in terms of the toxic response. The PCBs drop out, the pesticides drop out. But the two that kind of trump out at you as being important, pore water TIE, again, just at SS315, and the PAHs across the board. Okay. So, conclusions from the summer of 2007 was that phase one findings strongly suggest that non polar organics are the problem, with phase two findings suggesting that the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are at high enough concentrations to, to cause the noted toxicity. But as I said earlier, we also looked at different seasons. So, um, we do a comparison of one year apart seen this data already. This is the summer of 07 data I just showed a minute ago. Here's the summer of 08 data. As you can see from this, the trend is fairly similar. You get toxic, toxicity at the same sites. Um, again, the uh, closed or darkened bar or uh, stars represent uh, significant differences between that and the control. But the thing that jumps out at you is that the PCC, the powdered uh, coconut charcoal, is not being as effective at reducing the toxicity at these sites. And so we kind of shook our, scratch our heads and what the heck's going on here? And so we called uh, Teresa Norbert King and Dave Mount, some of those at EPA up in Duluth, Minnesota, that have developed these sediment uh, criteria. And they said, oh yeah, we see this problem all the time. So, Great, well, tell us before them. And so we, we asked the question, is this PCC always effective? You know, after we've already run these experiments. And they said, well, maybe not so. We found 46% of our sites across all seasons were characterized well by the PCC, indicating that they, when we found non polar organics or particular PDAHs, you saw an increase in survivorship when you put PCC in the system. And so I sent Tyler up with the SeaTac Travel Award, basically, and to Duluth to kind of investigate this further. And what Duluth was putting their hat on in terms of this as a potential problem is that the oils and greases associated with the pH of the site form what is called an unresolved complex mixture or matrix or mixture, UCM, right? And what they were suggesting is that you find higher levels of this UCM at sites where you find elevated PAHs. And we kind of found that. If you look at the data, here's our LPL site where we have low PAH concentrations and a low oil to grease of UCM. And then the, 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 the uh, sites where we found higher PAHs, we found higher percentage UCM associated with it. So the question comes down to then, how does this UCM actually affect the effectiveness of the PCC? Does it actually bind competitively with the PCC at the specific binding sites, not allowing the PCC to be effective at binding the actual PAHs? Is there a question that the organics or PAHs are more likely to stay in the UCM matrix than to go to the PCC? I don't think that one makes much sense. Um, but the third one's kind of what the EPA has been, um, again, favoring, which is maybe the UCM itself is causing toxicity. And so this is really research that's ongoing, and we're going to continue to do some of this work in collaboration with Jing and, uh, and Tyler in China, but also with the Duluth Lab.
So let's move on to some spatial and temporal variation in the data set. I've got, in this graph, I've got total pool water ammonia up here on the uh, first portion of the, of the water graph. Total cadmium metals here and PAH is here. Again, units were like, uh, defined earlier. As you go from left to right, I've got summer of 2007 to summer of 2008 across the bars. The two things that should jump out at you is that the section over here in blue, which is the Calumet SAG channel, basically has much lower concentrations across the board in comparison to the other sites that I'll show you in a moment. The other thing you should notice is that there's really not that much temporal variation among the data. There's a few sites that uh, one season may have elevated, but for the most part, they're pretty consistent, much more consistent than we thought they would be. So the, the Calumet SAG channel has lower concentrations. If you go to the Chicago Sanitarium Shipping Channel Canal, whammo, you get some very elevated uh, ammonia concentrations. These have been broken off, obviously, in terms of scaling. So you're talking 600 milligrams of nitrogen per liter, so very elevated. And fairly elevated PAH concentrations in comparison to the other uh, locations. So there appears to be very little temporal variation, but a fair amount of spatial variation in the data set. And so what we wanted to do next is to actually investigate, especially this spike in the ammonia that was going on in the system, and see if there was a, some type of, of a spatial trend in ammonia overall. And so we plotted the data from our whole data set, and again, we have total pool water ammonia on the y-axis and river mile on um, the Illinois River on the x. And you see there's a nice positive relationship. And the one uh, outlier at SS315 really stands out. And so we took that and actually further investigated that particular site and looked at the total pool water ammonia every river mile. And we did this on a, uh, across and did a gradient across each of these um, mile marker sites from 308 up to 318. And obviously you see a nice big spike at, at river mile 315. So then we went, okay, where is this coming from? We're not that familiar with Chicago. So maybe you all know where this is at. But we went into Google Earth and found a little sewage treatment plant there in Stickney uh, sewage treatment plant, which is the largest one in the um, world, I believe. And to give you a scaling for that, that's a baseball, full baseball size field. So it's a pretty big plant. And I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with this plant, Howard, because if you look at it, think about it. The plant's putting it in, and it's spiking a concentration of, what, 800 or so, 900 total pour water milligrams of nitrogen per liter. But at River Mile 314, it's dropped back down to those background levels. And so its mixing zone is working very, very well at taking a very high spike concentration in, and they should probably be uh, awarded for that, or at least uh, commended for it. So I thought that was really quite interesting, and TIEs can be used as a CI, that CSI approach, similar to what they've done on TV. Okay. So, Go compare back. I said the, this kind of this research was spurred on by Sparks and Ross's work in the early 1990s, and what they found is a graded increased toxicity associated with total uh, ammonia concentrations. But again, they used a a, uh, a uh, pool water type of approach. But I'd say that overall, we measured pool water concentrations, and ours did increase into levels at least at the SS315 site to cause toxicity. They decided, again, ammonia was the primary source of toxicity. Our whole sediment TIE did not agree with that. Ours basically said that there was PAHs and concentrations high enough to cause the noted toxicity. And theirs, and Alan Burton's in particular, saw patches of toxicity due to PAHs. So they're not really that in, in disagreement. But we wanted to investigate the ammonia thing again, because I thought that was really quite interesting. And so, we weren't comparing apples and apples because the earlier studies were again done with pore water, centrifuging the, centrifuging the water out of the sediment while we're using a whole sediment TIE. And so in this case, we went in and wanted to compare the two techniques. We also wanted to compare the different animals. And I don't know if too many people have tried this where you're putting C. dubia into a sediment type of exposure. And so again, uh, to compare the present and past experiments, but also the two techniques and the two animals. And we were provided the, the good uh, um, fortune of having two sites, SS315 with what was highest ammonia concentration, and SS308, which had very elevated PAH concentrations to use. So we're going to compare and contrast the methods with those two sediments. Just very quickly, the pour water characterization, uh, when you do this type of experiment, you separate the centrifugation in the sediment or pour water, and it takes a heck of a lot of sediment to get pour water out, by the way. So Tyler spent a lot of time getting enough pour water to actually run these tests. Note that I've 
done a 50% dilution of that initial pore water. That's because this, these uh, pore waters tend to be very toxic and because the uh, conductivity, the hardness, and the pH need to be adjusted by um, taking a 50% amount. Um, we use an unamended uh, container. We use zeolite again as our amendment for the ammonia. And we use, in this case, C18 cartridges, SPE cartridges, to take out the PAHs. I'm not going to worry about metals. We've already shown, and in, in several other studies, shown that metals are not a major concern. We have two animals, and we ran a two day test for the high loa and a one day test for the daphne. For the sediments, this, the same kind of setup as we had before um, with the uh, zeolites, the powdered coconut charcoal, and to do that for each of these sets. The only difference is that you run them again a static test with the ammonia, a throw through through the um, full fledged test with the other amendment, the PCC, and a two day test for the daphne. Right. Let's compare the methods. Why is there differences between these? You take the pore water, what do you do? You centrifuge it out and you get what is the water soluble component, the ammonia in the water. If you take the sediment TIE, you're actually taking it out and it will desorb out of that sediment very slowly. And so you're going to get a difference between the amount of that's bioavailable in each of those sections. And if you look at the phase one results for this, this is high levels tech on the top, C W on the bottom, percent survival, and your three amendments, the unamended, the zeolite amended, and the SPE. The thing that jumps out at you is that these the star values bars show a, a significant increase in survivorship in, this, in the systems where the zeolite is being amended. So it doesn't matter which animal it is or which site it was, the, uh, the suggestion is from that data is that the pool water TIE or the ammonia is the, is the problem in the system. If you look at that even further and look at the concentrations, as I mentioned a minute ago, the concentration is going to be much higher in the pore water TIE, about 10 times higher than what's in the whole sediment TIE. And then if you actually normalize that for toxic units, it kind of makes sense that in a pore water TIE, you would come up with the conclusion that ammonia is the major issue at that site. All right? Let's go and look at the non pore organics and see if it comes up with a different answer. Remember that there are a lot of factors that are going to be affecting the bioavailability in the system. UCM, which I talked about earlier, black carbon, which can affect things. Ingestion, absorption, dissolved organic carbon, binding the glassware, all can be problematic in this type of system. So in this case, when you centrifuge, you're going to get very few analytes or contaminants in the water because it's a non polar organic. It's not going to like that water phase. While in the whole sediment exposure, you're going to have all the contaminants in the system available for uptake. So, what do these results look like? Well, if you look at the top, the high level stack not only got the four bars, and remember there was a four day test and a 10 day test, one for two different uh, temporal scales for the toxicity test. But in each case, you get an increase in survivorship for the PCC and the zeolite. It was only for this SS315 site. The others did not show that effect, and it probably due to the black carbon, the PCC problems, and things like that. But it's strongly suggestive, again, that the PAHs are going to be the issue in this. And if you look at the concentrations in each of those, you have about a two-fold increase in tox or, uh, uh, PAH concentration in the sediment. And if you look at the TUs, the TUs would strongly suggest that PAHs are a problem in the whole sediment technique. Okay? I'll try to be brief with this. The two species we used also showed some differences in terms of sensitivity and susceptibility. If you look at total ammonia, the C. dubia has a much lower uh, LC50 associated with it than the high level stacket, even though the temporal scale is, is different. Uh, suggesting the C. dubia is more sensitive to ammonia than the high level stacket. While you get a PAH like foramethine, uh, the high level is much more toxic or much more sensitive to that uh, contaminant. So it probably is partly due to the fact that there, there's differential sensitivities between the two species, but there's also differential susceptibility due to the fact that you have differences in body size and age, the physiology and feeding behavior is different, and the niche they utilize is different. So if you have something in the water column, it's going to be differentially exposed to compounds than if it's down in the sediment rooting around and ingesting potentially sediment particles. So, conclusions. The toxic sites were identified in the IRC, and these can be used for future risk assessment mitigation purposes. I've had a number of phone calls and a lot of interest in our papers that are coming out on this. I assume because there's mitigation still ongoing. I don't know that's a fact, but uh, I've never had a paper, a series of papers have so many requests for the data. Um, 
The toxicity started at River Mile 277 with the DuPage River, went to the Calumet Sag Channel and Chicago Sanitary and Shipping District. PAHs and associated oils and greases were identified as the source of another toxicity. However, ammonia again was elevated to SS 315, and I showed you the, the reason why. Found little temporal variation in the toxicity and the concentrations. However, there were spatial trends were found, especially associated with ammonia. So, which type TIE approach is better, and where are TIEs headed? Well, I think both TIE approaches have pros and cons associated with it. If you want details on what we think are the pros and cons in detail, look at the second paper Tyler wrote, and I'll give you the details on that in a second. But basically, the, as I mentioned earlier, the whole sediment TIE is, think, is more environmentally realistic than the poor water TIE. The poor water TIE is nice because it's nice and simple, and you can use a poor water or a water column species for it in a very short-term test. So there's some advantages to each. Where is it headed? If you look at the EPA and talk to those folks, they say you should use both methods, especially as a screening tool, to figure out what's going on at the site. And I would be a, an advocate of that also, because after doing this, you can come up with totally different answers on what is the, actually the toxic components, not necessarily which sites are toxic, but which ones, which contaminants are the toxic components. And is the IRC a healthy system? Um, I'd argue that at least from the data we have, starting at the Page River, it still has pretty toxic sediments at least in terms of high level, that's tech of toxicity. However, you know, we're cruising along the river, we're seeing bald eagles, we see all the nice uh, bird species. We did find fingernail clams at sites, but most of those were downstream from the page. And so I think there's some, still some Chicago influence on the Illinois River. Knowledge, lots of folks in my lab, CTAC, um, uh, funding from you guys is uh, very, very beneficial. We couldn't run this without uh, funding from uh, IRA, uh, TC. And uh, if you want more information, we have two papers out. The first one details our whole sediment TIE testing, and that actually is in press in uh, ETC. We also have a uh, paper that's in review in Chemosphere, which details the, the relationship between the two methods. I want to take just one second to go through um, Tyler. Is there for I mean, no, Tyler and Nezhu Jing. He's off in China. and. Some of the earlier talks talked about their projects going further. And I think that's one of the objectives of these funding sources is to take it the next step. And so uh, Tyler's getting used to uh, China and the, the uh, uh, complexities of there. He said he's eaten some things he never thought he'd eat in his life. Um, but they're also going off and actually studying a series of river systems that I think will be a lot of fun. This is the Pearl River. You can see it's a slightly impacted river system. But they have four sites already selected throughout China to do development of TIEs. And to my understanding, there's not been any TIE development at all and or work in China. So I think this is a lot of fun for me. I get to go to China next June and to kind of continue our research uh, to another step. But I'd love to take any questions at this point, if, there, if you have time. Okay, we'll probably have time for one question. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you measure ammonia? I'm sorry? How do you measure ammonia? Uh, ammonia probe? Um, do you, when you uh, extract the pore water, do you adjust the pH or? We bring the, we use the, the we, again, try to simulate the conditions that are at the field. But the difficulty is site by site variation, the pH and temperature are quite substantial. And as you know, pH will greatly affect that. And so we try to keep it as standardized as possible. And that's why I went through the slide where we're using total. We have also gone in and actually measured and calculated unionized and ionized. And it actually is quite interesting that it doesn't match as well when you're in a poor water system than when you're using the whole setup. So it's actually much closer, especially on a TU basis, based on a uh, whole sediment TIA. Another reason maybe to use that system versus poor water. Thank you. 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 Thank